This is uh, Laws 13013, Legal Professional Conduct, Week 5, the topic of discipline, and looking at tutorial problems 22 to 25. All right. Um, I um, managed to um, make a short podcast in relation to last week's tutorial problems, and I've posted that up under the Week 4 tab. Um, so you've got some comments there on, I think, the main issues to look out for in those problems dealing with um, costs and retainer letters and also with um, trust accounting. Plus, you've got the answer guides for those all those problems because we got a bit disrupted um, with um, Stafford Shepherd's uh, lecture, which I thought was quite good, actually, because it did give you an overview of quite a few areas that you'll be covering throughout the rest of the course. Um, with the trust accounting materials, just work your way through that slowly. Um, the main thing to note is that you need to make sure that your primary source documents, so things like trust account receipts and trust account checks, are done properly and check butts as well, um, because everything else is based on that. So all of your secondary accounts um, gain all of the information from those primary records. So it's really important to get that correct. So if they're wrong, the whole system after that's going to be wrong. So um, just bear that in mind. I mean, it's not difficult sort of stuff. And the regulations are very clear as to what's required in each of those source documents. And the actual trust accounting guide that the Law Society has put together is quite good as well. It just takes time to work your way through it. But do persevere. You're going to be... Um, going to need that knowledge when you do PLT because they will have big components on trust accounting because that's one of the major um, uh, priestly 12, not priestly 11, but the priestly 12 requirements for PLT is having competency in the trust accounting area. Okay, so just have a look, listen to that podcast. It doesn't go that long, but it does It does highlight the key items to just to watch out for when you go through the materials. Um, now, this week, we've got problems 22 to 25. The first problem, problem 22, is quite easy because we've actually covered that earlier in the course. Um, you remember when you had that exercise and had a look at what ChatGTP would produce? Um, so we don't really have to spend, I don't even think we need to spend any time on that problem, actually, because um, you've actually been through that. But I will post up an answer for that one. Um, the other thing that's happened is uh, ChatGTP4 has been released and ChatGTP5 is actually now being tested and released to select a few people. So these systems are moving very quickly. Um, there was um, a query early on in um, oh, during this week uh, about using it to answer tutorial questions. So... Um, I just, and that was Carlo. So thanks, Ray. I think it was Carlo. Raise that issue. So thanks for raising that. But I think it's important that, um, that you actually have a go at these questions because that's really where you learn by thinking about these issues. Um, and then if you want to have a look at what the, the chat GTP um, type systems produce. Um, no, I was just trying to try it out to see what it came up with. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no that was fine. I, I don't have a problem with it. Just... No, no, I mean, um, I don't think it is as good as everyone's saying it is. On, on no, screen. it isn't. It does have flaws with it. Um, I did a simple test today, actually. I just asked it, um, what did it know about me? <laughs> so I put in my... My name, is, and it was it was telling me that I I was a sort of specialist in writing books in areas that I don't write in anything. So I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, so yeah, it does it does have issues. Well, but Bill, um, I put up a post as well. Uh, there's a counsellor, I'm not sure where, but um, um, he's trying to sue um, OpenAI because it's giving false information about him. That that's right. I thought it was. I thought that was quite interesting. So he's he's going to sue for defamation, um, because he. I think it, I think it said he was from memory. It was he was a whistleblower, but it it suggested he was something other than that. Uh, so that'll be an interesting case to um, watch. Uh, now, Carlo, your camera is odd. You look like a little bit like Dickie Knee used to 
that's better. We just sort of see in the top of your head there. But anyway, okay. Um, yeah, so watch the space because it is a tool, no doubt, you'll be using when you get out into practice, those sorts of tools. So it is important to, to become familiar with them and what their flaws are. But equally, well, not equally, but more importantly, you really do need to know how to um, think about legal problems and how to answer them. And you'll be dealing with people, which is the other aspect of the, of the job. Is, you know, it's focused on dealing with clients. Okay, so we'll actually skip 22 and look at problem 23. So problem 23 is about Todd as a sole practitioner in a country town. He's got a messy divorce. His daughter's overdosed on drugs and suicidal. He drinks heavily. Um, and it's not surprising his work's suffering. He's had counselling, but the situation's deteriorating. His clients are experiencing long, experiencing long delays in completion of their files. There's been various complaints made to disciplinary authorities. He's then prioritised those cases and completed them quickly. Um, Mary's an 80-year-old uh, widow. She sought advice from Todd in relation to personal injuries claim. Uh, this is a bit of a problem. The statute of limitations expired before Todd filed her claim. There's very, very few things that you can't actually fix one way or another, but that is one that you can't really fix very easily. Um, the statute of limitations has expired. The only way around that is if your opponent is stupid enough to take a step in the action and waive their right to that statutory defence. Uh, I wouldn't want to be relying on that as a solution. So that's one thing that you have to be extremely careful about, and that's um, time limits, statutory time limits and the Limitation of Actions Act. It's something you'll do in civil procedure, but that's an error that's very difficult to correct, and you probably can't correct it if you miss those periods and it's your fault, which it is in, in the case of Todd. So Mary's gone, got advice from another solicitor, is now suing Todd for negligence. Fair enough. Uh, the Legal Services Commission is um, it's notified and investigating. It's gone off to QCAT. She's only claiming $25,000 damages for her loss. So that's pretty light on. Um, and QCAT has to decide whether Todd's conduct constitutes professional misconduct. And if it is, or, or it's uh, unprofessional conduct, then what's the appropriate penalty and compensation order? Everybody knows about Todd's problems in this little town. And, and you are to advise Todd. So how are you going to approach this sort of problem? And these things do happen, you know. People have all sorts of life problems. So, yep. You define um, what his failings are yep. by, by stating maybe that it falls short of the standard of competence and diligence that a member of, of the public is entitled to expect of a reasonably competent lawyer. All right. So just go back one step. So you're so are you talking about professional misconduct or are you talking about unsatisfactory professional conduct? Probably unsatisfactory professional conduct, section 418. Okay. So what what is section 418? What does it actually say? You've actually sort of summarized, but just go, just we take it in steps. Looking at section 418, what, what does it say? What, what, what are the elements of it? It's defined as conduct of a lawyer occurring in connection with the practice of a law. Okay, stop there. That's the first limb of it. So you can see um, it's um, how, how conduct occurring in connection with the practice of law. How is that different from professional misconduct? That first limb. It's very different from professional misconduct. Do, do you know what it, what the difference is? It's limited, isn't it, to the practice of law, whereas professional misconduct can extend outside the practice of law and look at your general conduct. So it's, it's narrower. Okay, so it has to be uh, in connection with the practice of law. Fair enough. Keep going. So what's the next limb? Um, well, the next thing, it, uh, 
it falls short of the standard of competence and diligence. Okay, stop. So you've then got to look at what are the standards of competence and diligence. So what, what are the standards of competence and diligence? How do you measure that? Well, he, he failed in... Um, well, no, don't look at his failures. Just generally, how would you measure that standards of competence and diligence? He should have known better, really, that, it, that, that the Limitations Act was there and that he needed to act on it and do it in a timely manner. Would that yep. be right? No. Well, yes, but you're focusing on this. You're focusing on Todd. I'm asking more generally, how do you... Well, what out. you would expect from a solicitor in that position. What sort of a solicitor? Is it an expert solicitor or is it a newly admitted solicitor? Is it not my likely... abilities and skills in solicitors? So how do you try and work this out? Is it not to be judged by the expectations of the public most likely on the standards observed by legal practices competent in the relative area of practice who are yeah. able to determine what constitutes competent and diligent practice in that area. That's right. That's right. So it's really the expectations of the public. Remember, the whole idea of all these rules is to protect the public, not to punish the solicitor. Uh, although, I mean, that is a consequence potentially, but it's to protect the public. So it's viewed from the context of the public so, and it's judged against the standards of a competent solicitor in the relevant area of practice. Okay. So it's not a perfect solicitor. I mean, solicitors do make errors, but it's one that is viewed as generally competent, reasonably competent. Okay. So that's the sort of standard we're looking at. And what, what's the next part of it? The definition is, is not exhaustive. It may not be limited to merely to the relationship between the practice and the client, a practitioner, sorry, and the client. It can extend beyond that. So to your yeah. everyday general. Yeah, that's self. right. That's right. So that's how we're looking at Todd. That's the lens, if you want to want of a better term. So what has Todd done? And how does that relate to that? definition of the various limbs of it. I think it sounds like statutory interpretation, this, isn't it? But <laughs> so what's um so what's Todd actually done? The missing of the um, statutory limitation timeline is a big boo-boo. So that's the worst thing he's done, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The other the others are fall into that low level of conduct or misconduct. That's right. So the, the issues of delay, delay in divorce matters, delay in conveyancing matters. Something you can't fix is a big error. Yes, that's right. So that's the one that's really going to come home to roost, isn't it, with Todd? And that's why he's going to most likely be in a situation of unsatisfactory professional conduct. Um, because the consequences of breaching a limitation period is that um, the defendant to the claim can just plead the statute of limitations and say, you can't proceed with this claim. They, they've got a perfect defence. It's based on legislation. So it, it, that's the end of the case. So um, if given that they've been sued, they've incurred costs of you know, represent, getting themselves represented, um, you know, and filing documents and all the rest of it, they're entitled to recover all of those costs. Um, and yeah, so, so Todd's not going to get around that, that issue at all. Um, so can it be worse than that? Can it get to professional misconduct? Certainly, it's certainly unprofessional conduct, but what's professional misconduct? What, what are the requirements for that? Where do we look for that? So you talked about be, uh, be along the lines, probably be along the lines of not meeting the obligation of the pro profession intentionally. Right. And to me, that is professional misconduct, right? Yeah, but I mean, you've got it. You, that's that's a sort of twenty-four thousand 
feet <laughs> meter interpretation. You got to refer, always refer back to the provision. So I, I think it was Amy there for a second. I have to get my um, uh, my little chat get box going there. Um, yeah, Amy. Um, so Amy's identified rule. Sorry, section four one nine of the Legal Profession Act. So that's correct. So when we look at that, it defines what professional misconduct is. And it's an inclusive definition. So it includes unsatisfactory professional conduct of an Australian legal practitioner, which we've already just established we think is the case. If the conduct involves a substantial or consistent failure to reach or keep a reasonable standard of competence and diligence. So substantial, well, it is substantial, Consistent. Um, well, there is some consistency in the lower level failures. So, I mean, you could argue that you've got consistent delays in a few cases, plus this more damaging breach of this um, statutory, you know, statute of limitations. So maybe if we fall within that, that's but could part he of not, it. Could he not, um, because as you know how you're saying it's this repetitive, it's only repetitive due to the course of the incidents that are occurring in his life. So had his daughter not overdosed and he had a messy divorce, he probably would be on top of it. That's right. So they're the sort of factors he'd have to argue, um, you know, that there are mitigating circumstances. Like it's not his general behaviour is what I'm trying to point yeah, to. Yeah, that's right. So that's what he would argue. But let's just go through the definition first then we'll come back to how he would approach trying to deal with this situation. So that was... Part A. Part B then says, um, and, so it's it's additional, conduct of an Australian legal practitioner, whether happening in connection with the practice of law or happening otherwise in the connection of practice of law. Well, it is within the practice of law, so it falls within the first part of that. Uh, would, if established, justify a finding that the practitioner is not a fit and proper person to engage in legal practice? So what, what's a fit and proper person? Where have you heard that before? That was in terms of admissions. That's right. So that's sort of talked about um, in admissions. And in subsection two of section 419, it says, for finding that an Australian legal practitioner is not a fit and proper person to engage in legal practice, as mentioned in subsection one, regard may be had to, lo and behold, the suitability matters. Remember those? That was in section nine, all those suitability matters for admission. Again, they pop up here. So that's taken into account in terms of whether they're a fit and proper person. So, you know, Todd could easily fall within the, the you know, boundaries of section 419 as well. So now let's start to look at what can Todd say? Well, what, what firstly should Todd do to try and um, better his position? Cooperate. Yes, and how would he do that? Could he pay the $25,000? That, that's the first thing I'd be telling him to do. Settle that $25,000 claim. Pay it out. It's not a huge amount of money compared with, you know, your career. And, in fact, his insurance, if, if this was um, covered by professional indemnity insurance, which it may well be, they would just pay this out. It's not a large claim. So, you know, the worst thing you could do is fight over $25,000 with an 80-year-old um, widow in front of QCAT. How's that going to look? That's, you know, it doesn't sort of pass the pub test, does it? So you would, you would, um, you would pay that out and get rid of that whole claim. Um, that doesn't get rid of the complaint made against him because it's already happened, but it does indicate that he's accepted responsibility for it. Um, and that he has made, um, you know, uh, compensated uh, the widow for that. I'd also say you should pay the costs that they've incurred as well. Because quite frankly, he's, he's ultimately going to be ordered to pay all of that anyway. So you may as well do it up front to lessen the, the impact on your career. Because um, you can have compensation orders made by, you can, and it's highly likely that would happen here. So let's look at the mitigating factors that were, were mentioned. Um, so what can he establish in terms of mitigating, in terms of mitigation? 
Well, they're not really excuses. He can't really use all the family matters as an excuse for his behaviour. Not really. No, no, he's going to have to do better than that. Yeah. So what's he going to have to do? I um, I sort of went with um, the um, case of um, a practitioner from 1984 mm -hmm. um, where they talked about that he, like, succumbed to temptations produced by his difficult personal and financial position um, and that he didn't, like, I, like, in that case, though, that solicitor was struck off because he had, um, it was a lot more fraudulent. But in this case, I sort of went down the track that well, he didn't, as far as we know on the facts, he didn't commit any, he wasn't like actively committing fraudulent behavior. He was just more so negligent in his duties. Yes. Um, and so I thought that using that as a precedent, he could argue that rather than being struck off, that a suspension would be a more appropriate uh, exactly. Penalty. That's exactly right. Because, you know, if there was fraud involved here, he, he's had it. <laughs> he would be struck off without a doubt. But there's no fraud. Um, so he's got a chance. And I think, I think he'd be able to argue his way out of it. What else can he do? So what you said is correct. So that, that's, that's... Well, I thought with that, he would probably need to show that he's making amends, like going to rehab or going to a counsellor to yep. say, I'm making a step in the direction of being better able to handle these emotional situations. That's right. And, and he would also, you know, if he's got some sort of solid community um, and professional reputation that he can point to, like if he's, you know, he, he volunteers and does all of this sort of work for the community, you would point to all of those sorts of things. You collect references from the people who run those organisations about how good he is and this is only, a, you know, a new thing that's happened because of all of these other factors. Um, he, you know, he, he needs to display candor so he can't, you know, he needs to cooperate and he needs to demonstrate some sort of remorse that he's sorry for his actions. All of those sorts of things are going to help you. The last thing you want is a really arrogant solicitor coming along and saying, I'm not paying this old biddy $25,000 at all. Um, it's not my fault. Um, you know, I've got all of these issues, but, um, you know, I don't really care. You know, you don't want to have that sort of attitude because that is, that's not going to get you anywhere. So the court, or this, well, actually this QCAT is a court despite its name. It's called a tribunal, but it is actually a court when you look up its legislation that creates it. Um, it's going to look for all of those sorts of factors we talked about. Um, so I think the end result is what's already been suggested, that I don't think he would be struck off. It's likely he might get a period of suspension, and it certainly would have to pay compensation. But if he's already done that, well, that's already happened, so there might be an order compensation order. Uh, he'll have to pay costs. He could get a fine as well. Um, but I don't think he'll be struck off for what's, what's happened. If there was any dishonesty attached to it, then he would have been. Um, in terms of him, if he was struck off, in terms of him getting struck on again, if I can put it that way, that is really difficult, especially if there's any, any element of dishonesty or fraud. Um, if there's fraud on a trust account, the likelihood of coming back is pretty low. I don't recall a case where that's actually happened. Um, so but what can a solicitor do after they've been struck off? I mean, oh, well, I, you know, I've, I've, I've no one's sort of been struck off. And they get in, they get work in insurance companies and oh, okay. they get employed in other, they don't get employed as a solicitor, but they can still use their legal skills in other, you know, in other, just plenty of other jobs lawyers can do, um, apart from being a lawyer as such. So they do get, you know, they, they're not sort of banned for life from ever working anywhere. Um, they can get jobs, but um, yeah, they've always got that um, sort of stain on their career hanging over them. They can't, there's nothing you can do about it. I've seen them um, reapplying for admission, you know, 10, 20 years after these sorts of events, and they just get nowhere. The Bar Association, um, you know, like in New South Wales anyway, the Bar Association would object, the, the solicitors, um, the Law Society would object. And then, you know, you've got all of these adverse opinions going to the, the board that reconsiders their applications and they just don't go anywhere. Um, 
So you never want to be in that position. So you've got to be very careful about how you manage, particularly client money. That's why I sort of perhaps overemphasizing money matters. It's, it's really important. That's the thing they really focus on. And you can run over people and manslaughter and all sorts of things, but you know, eventually you'll get back into practice. But if you take their money, you've had it. So anyway. All right, that's enough on that one. Problem 24, we'll keep going. Um, all right, in the Suvaro against the Bar Association of New South Wales, the appeal panel of the Legal Services Division of the Administrative Decisions Tribunal, um, it's the sort of the equivalent of QCAT for that, our sort of purposes, upheld the decision of um, um, a tribunal in the Bar Association of New South Wales and De Suvaro. The appeal panel found that a barrister who uses abusive language that is dis disrespectful towards the judge and opposing counsel can still be found guilty of unsatisfactory professional conduct without being held in contempt. Okay, so remember in the in the face of the court or in the precincts of the court, if you do something uh, that you know offends the judge or the administration of justice, it is open for a um, judge to make a finding of contempt. Okay. Um, but this case was basically saying you can engage in un satisfactory professional conduct um, where it involves abusive language towards a judge. This is in the court, even if the judge doesn't find contempt. So it's, you don't have to have contempt to still um, have unsatisfactory professional conduct. Okay, so that was what that appeal panel found. He was suspended from practice for three months. Okay, language held to be abusive, including on five separate occasions, the word improper, concerning the actions of the prosecutor. He also said to the judge who had closed the court to the public for most of the Crown's case, we will have a star chamber in the proceedings where sometimes the court is closed and sometimes it's open. So what's the star chamber? What's that a reference to? Is that a reference to the judge choosing what he wants to do when he wants to do it? It's no consistency or anything? Yeah, no, no, it goes a long way back in history, this idea. Are we talking about star witnesses who... No, no, not star witnesses, a star chamber. It's, a, it's an historical court. Does anybody know? No one's ever heard of it, I suppose. Put it into chat GTP, uh, it says. Royal, royal court, like an old English court. Yeah, it's an old English court, but... What was what was the nature of it? Why is it so notorious? If I remember right, was it the one like a like a supplement one? Like it was in addition to the um, other courts because there was a lot of um, like unfairness back in the days. It's certainly a particular court, but it, what made it notorious is that people would go into that court, and it was a closed court. And sometimes they never came out. Uh, you know, they'd be sent off to the colonies or executed. It so it was not open to the public. So that's what this is the reference. That's why it's referenced in this way. So this this barrister to say we will have a star chamber in the proceedings where sometimes the court is closed, which is what the star chamber was. No one had access apart from the judge and whoever was arguing the case and the accused. That was it. There was no public scrutiny on it because remember justice is supposed to be administered in open court, so the media and anybody else can go along and watch it. The Star Chamber was not like that. So that's what this reference, and it was a notorious court. So it's uh, it's almost a, um, it's a derogatory thing to say to a judge these days. Anyway, um, do you think an advocate has a right to point out misbehavior by a judge or opposing counsel without being disciplined? How strenuous, strenuously do you think an advocate can represent his or her client, especially in criminal cases, how would you define fearless or zealous advocacy? So what do you think about these? How far can you go if um, in arguing your client's case? And if you feel that 
the judge. Stephen, I, I think thing. that uh, a lot of lawyers would go as far as possible and it's just bring, right. bordering on contempt. <laughs> some of them push the envelope. That's yeah, true. Yeah, exactly. That is true. Um, so I think there's... it's also about knowing too, sorry, Stephen, about yeah. what the judge or magistrate, whoever you're in front of, and you know what their tolerance is or how much you can or cannot push too, because they've all got a different attitude of how their court is run. That's right. Be my experience. So knowing who you're in front of mm. before you get there, you've got an idea. Um, it's the same in front of a mediator. And, you know, if you know how that mediator runs the show, you're going to then put your case forward with the way that they would expect it, I guess. That's right. So they've all got their own personalities and foibles, we put it that way. So you know, you know, through experience, that's why it's why it's good to hire if you, you know, you want to, if you need to be represented by somebody, that's why you want to get somebody with experience because they know that sort of knowledge. They only gain it because they're continually interacting with these people. Um, so uh, there are some cases on this. Um, so there's Myers and Edmund. That was the first one. It's in a 1940s appeals cases. Um, Lord Wright. And he said, the underlying principle is that the court has a right and a duty to supervise the conduct of its solicitors and visit with penalties any conduct of a solicitor which is of such a nature as tend to defeat justice in the very cause in which he is engaged professionally. So that's saying, okay, the court has a supervisory jurisdiction to deal with this issue. Fair enough. Then we've got the prothonotary of the uh, Supreme Court of New South Wales and Costello, 1984, three New South Wales law reports. You've got two judges, Glass and Samuels. They're saying observed courage and aggression are acceptable and sometimes necessary weapons in the barrister's armory. Calculated insult and insolence are not. So you can be, a, maybe it'd be better to say you can be assertive, and according to those judges, you can even be downright aggressive, um, but you can't insult people or be insolent. So, you know, there's a fine line there. Um, you know, you are there, you are there as an advocate to put forward your client's case. That's how the system works. It's, works. it's an adversarial system. Um the judge is supposed to be the impartial arbiter of what's going on, but you rely, you as a client, are relying on your advocate to put your case forward to the best of their ability. And if they have to do that forcefully, fine. Um, but then again, as you say, you've got to watch the temperament of the particular judge and know where your boundaries are. Okay. Um, so... Um, in that particular case, the, uh, that Costello case, um, the barrister was found guilty of professional misconduct um, in relation to five incidences, two involving a magistrate, three involving other barristers. Um, while there was a declaration of uh, professional misconduct, they weren't struck off. And the reason they weren't struck off, while it was still regarded as reprehensible, the judges thought that the barrister could change their approach in the future. And basically, they gave a warning. If it happens again, you will be struck off. So that's what happened there. Um, so, you know, you can... Well, what's your alternative? If you think the judge is stuffed up and, you know, it's done something they shouldn't have, admitted evidence that they shouldn't have or made a ruling which you think is inappropriate, and that's caused detriment to your client. What's what's the correct approach? Isn't it the right point? But what's the correct approach? Isn't it just a request leave to appeal? Exactly. It's an appeal. That's your avenue to address that sort of issue. You can raise the, you know, you can raise your argument in court, but if you're ruled against, that's the end of it. Uh, in terms of that particular case, your avenue is one of, of you know, an appeal. Sometimes you need leave, sometimes you don't. And you'll find out when you do and when you don't when you do civil procedure. So you don't need leave to appeal in all sorts of, in, in every case, by any means. You do in some cases. You do certainly with the High Court, you have to have special leave to appeal there. Um, but you do need leave to appeal, say, in the Supreme Court for cost orders, things like that. But generally, you have a right of appeal. 
Okay, so um, what about, does it make any difference if it's a criminal case as opposed to a civil case? What do you think? Um, isn't there um, where you probably might be heading um, an evidential uh, situation where <clears throat> within a criminal matter, um, it's uh, beyond reasonable doubt in a civil manner. Um, On the balance of time, oh, which is. Thank you. That, it just yeah. jumped out of my head as what I was trying to say. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, different, there's different evidential proof requirements, but the big difference between a criminal case and a civil case is that you can get locked up <laughs> in a criminal case. So, you know, it's about liberty of the individual. Um, so it has pretty... Um, harsh consequences potentially for the accused. So some would argue that, you know, there's more flexibility in the criminal case and there might be some truth to that. But again, it comes to the temperament of the judicial officer you're dealing with or registrar or whatever capacity um, the person making the decision has. Stephen, just out of interest, mm -hmm. is there, like in terms of that sort of, I mean, I understand like your avenue is to appeal, but is there anything in turn, like with judges, is it just up to them, their demeanor? Like if it's not necessarily, oh, I've got an issue with a decision that they've made, but it's maybe their temperament or something. Um, is that just that like they can just act however they want to act and you just cop it as a lawyer? Or are there like um, other avenues like profession, you know, where you can sort of question things? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there have been examples for, um, where there's been extensive delay in making in the judge handing down decisions because the normal position and you see practice directions in relation to this is that generally the decision should be handed down within three months of the end of the case um, but there's instances where people have gone years without making a decision so then there's um, you know avenues of approaching the chief justice in relation to those sorts of problems but remember that under the separation of powers um, judges basically it's very difficult to question them they're they're appointed until the official age of senility which is 70 <laughs> um, that's that's uh, you know they're there. So um, if you've got a rogue judge, it's very difficult to remove them. There would have to be a finding of mental um, or physical incompetence for that to happen. And that would have to be proved medically and all the rest of it before a judge can be removed. Very difficult to do. Um, so, yeah, you know, there, there have been histories of aggressive judges and because they're all different sorts of personalities. Um, Even I've had a couple of cases um, in the last couple of years where that judgment hasn't been made by a judge um, that was in the federal circuit court. And we actually went through the QLS process and putting an inquiry through there. Um, and then they then look into it for you and then they can action and provide you with an update or all of a sudden you've got a result from the court, which has been interesting. Yeah, it's very... It's a very difficult area because if they haven't handed down their decision, you don't want to sort of prod the beast, if I can put it that way. You don't want to annoy them. Or you don't want to start ringing up their associates and say, when is the decision going to be handed down? You know? what and who you're dealing with, I think, as well, because there are some that are renowned for not passing that judgment down. Mm. Um, and then others, are, I think people are just impatient to get a response either. That's That's right. So, and you've got to remember just looking, and I was a judge's associate in the Supreme Court for 12 months, many, many years ago. And yeah, they, they actually were pretty hard, the judges. You, you might think they have a fairly uh, easy life, but I'm, I can assure you they don't. There is just constant pressure in terms of hearing cases and writing decisions. And um, often they, all of this is run back to back. So they're writing decisions at the same time they're hearing cases it's it's not an easy life by any means. So I'm not surprised there is delay. Um, so and, and some have um, greater capacity to get through the work than others because they're different people, different personalities and capabilities. So um, yeah, 
anyway, that's probably all I can say about all of that. Um, all right, how are we going? 7.39, all right. Um, problem 25. All right, let's have a look at this one. Abdullah is extremely excited. Uh, at the commencement of his first position as a lawyer, he's been admitted in April, he began employment in May. He's got a practicing certificate, it'd be a supervised one, but nonetheless, it's a practicing certificate. He works for a boutique commercial law firm with one principal, two other lawyers, and two support staff. So it's a small firm environment. Um, so they've got some wealthy clients. They get to have a reputation of getting things done. Abdullah's first client is a woman aged in her 60s. Uh, she wants to sue a large public company for misleading and deceptive conduct. He takes her instructions, prepares memorandum for his principal, outlining the facts and advice. Okay, fair enough. Principal reviews the memorandum and quickly, quickly and says, she'll be a great client. She has a reputation for being quite eccentric. No problem. Well, do whatever she asks. So that was the extent of his supervision, which is pretty limited, isn't it? Abdullah then asks for some guidance on running the misleading and deceptive conduct action. Of course he does, because he doesn't know how to do it. He has no experience. The principal goes on to say, Bess, get out of here. I'm flat out. You'll be fine with that file and that client. So he's not being supervised. Okay. Abdullah is eager at the prospect of this wealthy client. He's going to meet his budget. Um, he thinks that the case will not only get good uh, publicity for the firm, but it'll put him in the limelight. Um, he makes some inquiries, discovers that the public company does not like litigation, is likely to settle. Abdullah puts together a costs agreement and a disclosure statement in which he states his hourly fee is $440. So we'll talk about whether that's a reasonable amount and sends it to his client with a short letter of advice. He spends the next two weeks researching the law and receiving deceptive conduct. And without instructions, that's not the instruction, or warning, files an application to the Supreme Court. Um, meanwhile, um, so um, he forwards an interim bill of cost to his client for $35,200, stating he's worked on the file for 80 hours, $440 per hour. Right. So what are the issues here? Well, you didn't get approved. <laughs> okay, one at a time. There's plenty of them. <laughs> so, excessive with his charging? Right, so there's a potential issue on overcharging. It's one thing to look at. Yeah. What else? Well, not getting approval or a contract signed. Okay, so he's acting without instructions, starting proceedings without instructions. Yep, what else has he done? Or what other issues are there? He did not give uh, enough supervision to one of his employees. Yep, so, well, okay, that's right. So that's, a, that's an issue with his principal. Just, just focus on Abdullah first, then we'll look at the principal. So we've got overcharging, instituting proceedings without instructions. What else? Just have well, um, I mean, it says that he sent a cost disclosure, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't really tell us whether it's in like line with the with section three hundred eight, which mm -hmm. details what needs to be. And in particular, I thought it doesn't say, um, or it doesn't tell us whether it, he's disclosed to her like on the basis of like that she has a right to negotiate that cost agreement, um, what the range of costs would likely increase to if it becomes litigious, which obviously now is an issue given that he's mm. filed these things. <laughs> um, so it doesn't sound like the cost agreement he sent her was very detailed. That's right. And so there may well be problems with that. And what's the consequence if you don't comply with those provisions? It could be set aside. Yeah, so the, um, the client doesn't pay the bill. So that's a pretty big um, situation. What other problems has Abdullah got? Competence. He doesn't know what he's doing, does he? He has no idea. And why should the client be paying for his training? Because that's effectively what's happening. He's gone off and researched, you know, he spent, how long has he spent? Quite a, quite a lot of time anyway, 80 hours researching, um, you know, misleading and deceptive conduct. Should the client be paying for all of that research? 
so that's an issue too and that also relates to overcharging um okay so that's some of the issues or the main issues with Abdullah what about the principle what's the principle's problem he must have had some sort of minor stroke when he came up with that um <laughs> that excuse yeah he's he's yeah, not failure to supervise anybody. yeah failure to supervise because you've got responsibilities because this is a, a young solicitor with a limited practicing certificate that's supposed to be supervised uh, and it hasn't happened so that's going to be a problem in terms of um and you know professional misconduct even or at least unprofessional conduct in relation to that issue of supervision so it can be quite serious with that principle okay other things you might want to talk about would be the complaints process uh, possible sanctions um etc so let's go through these issues a little bit so the first thing is the practicing certificate he's got a limited practicing certificate he's got to be supervised is he competent no, he's not competent. You don't expect him to be competent. I mean, this assumption that people graduate from law school and um, PLT and are suddenly competent to do everything is a complete myth. I actually find it quite interesting, Stephen, that you say it like, you know, a lot of people have this assumption that, you know, when you finish your bachelor's or whatever, you seem to know everything. I get it now, friends and family. They're like, oh, you should know you're going to be a lawyer or you are a lawyer. And it's like, dude, I'm at this point in time, a lawyer with my L plates on to an extent, like I am still learning and people already have that assumption now and we're not Absolutely. even completely qualified or admitted. So, And the profession actually has that assumption as well. There's a law society survey that was done recently uh, as to the um, as to the profession's um, uh, opinion on the, you know, how competent lawyers, new lawyers were having completed law school and and PLT, and it's an assumption there that they're actually able to do anything given to them. And it's just a myth because, it, you know, you start off and you've got your training wheels on, you need to be supervised. And if you've got a proper supervisor, they will give you little jobs or parts of other jobs that other people are managing so that you can see how things are done and you learn through that experience. And gradually, you'll gain competency in a particular area. And over time, your area expands. And, you know, you're quite capable of handling all sorts of things. But when you first start, it's it's very hard. You know, it's a steep learning curve. And you're dealing with clients and all sorts of things that you're not used to necessarily. And, you know, you're going to, like Abdullah did here, it's going to spend inordinate amounts of time looking up stuff. When, in fact, they should be supervised and given some direction and just to contain the costs. So all the firm wears those costs as part of training Abdul, you know. So the firm, you would expect to have some sort of training program or at least proper supervision. So, you know, he hasn't had that. So his competence is very limited. Um, and generally, uh, that lack of competence can be seen as an aggravating factor in damages that may be awarded um, to, in our case here, the client. So. Um, there's a case here, Oldham and the Law Institute of Victoria, um, and, and the judge there, Bowman, Jay, stated, ignorance of the rules relating to class actions, as that case was about, was an aggravating factor as opposed to a mitigating factor. So you can't front up and say, well, you know, I'm a new solicitor, I didn't know what the rules were. <laughs> That's actually perceived as an aggravating factor. It's not mitigation that you don't have that skill and knowledge. You should recognise you don't have that and then seek to get better supervision. That's what you've got to do. So the whole issue of competence is well, well and truly there. Um, and that's a, um, you know, rule 4.1.3 is about having competence. So that's a breach. Okay, instituting proceedings without instructions. That's a real problem. So he's filed an application in the Supreme Court, hasn't got instructions. Um, he obviously doesn't understand his obligations, what he's required to do. Um, and there's common law cases precisely on this, and he'll get exposed to a cost order. Um, or his client's been subjected to a cost order. 
Because you remember, if the institute proceeds, there is another side who then has to respond to it or is default judgment. Costs are getting incurred. Um, and if, if, you know, if it proceeded to default judgment, that would have been set aside, all sorts of um, adverse consequences. So um, the rules, rule eight of the professional conduct rules require you to follow your client's lawful, proper and competent instructions. Another breach of the professional rules. Okay, so Abdul is not going too well. He's, he's breached competency, he's breached the instruction rules. Then we get to overcharging, potentially. Steve, uh, Yep. I also noticed here on the third paragraph where it says, uh, eager at the prospect of having a wealthy client as he will be sure to meet his budget. Mm, yeah. He has a budget. Everybody has a budget. I can assure you when you get into practice, you will have a budget. You will have, you know, well, I can remember years ago when I was in the firms, it, it, it was all based on six-minute intervals. You had to record every second of what you did all day. And you were required, well, when I was doing it, it was six and a half hours per day had to be billable. And that's a pretty steep requirement to meet. So everything you do is written down and allocated and assigned to a file. So you do have a budget. and they will look at whether you're meeting your, you know, when I say they, the law firm will look at whether you're meeting that budget or not meeting that budget. And they'll use that uh, against you in terms of promotions or lack of promotion or whatever. Um, these days it will be a lot worse. They're probably using analytics tools to measure all of those things. Um, even when I was doing all that many, many years ago, we used to have um, things attached to our computers where you have to swipe the barcode of the actual file as soon as you looked at it did whatever you were doing, put file notes on what you did, um, then swipe off and it was all calculated and documented. And that was that was like 30 years ago. Um, so yeah, you do have a budget. So everything's- I, I interpreted that as something else. So what did you interpret it as? <laughs> I thought uh, he had to meet a certain amount. No, it probably does. <laughs> it probably does. Whether he, whether he knew that or not, who knows? A lot of those things are, are fairly secret in many law firms. Um, but anyway, his, his, this, this question of $440 is an interesting one because um, particularly large law firms, even large accountancy firms, charge a lot of money for graduates. So $440 may not be unrealistic these days for those sort of fees for somebody who's straight out of, you know, law school with, with no experience. Um, for smaller firms, you know, smaller suburban type firms, those sort of figures are probably too high. Um, but so it just can, depends. Oh, yeah. I was just going to ask a question. Like, obviously, um, we touched on it at the very start about the whole, it's not up to the client to pay to, for him to train himself. And obviously, like, 80, for him spending 80 hours is probably pretty unreasonable but in normal like in, in the normal course of practice like lawyers probably do have to spend some time like um either refreshing themselves or looking up the most recent right. cases and precedents so right. is, yeah. is it a nuance of how much are you actually allowed to charge your client it comes or... down to what a reasonably competent practitioner with that sort of would would incur um i think on our facts it's too much you know, no, I don't begrudge people um, spending time to look up what the law is. You can't remember everything. Um, Stephen, it's really interesting. And Talitha, on that topic, I was reading um, a bit of a paper the other day, and it was talking about um, some, like, it actually gave some scenarios about what overcharging um, could be. And it talked about, you know, when they're doing research on points of law, which, um, obviously, didn't warrant the charges being made. Um, time spent downloading tribe decisions, not necessarily reading them, but just the downloading aspect. Um, if there was like intra-office conferrals where one solicitor charged their time mm. uh, for preparing inter-office memos, charging work, which was done by a summer or like a winter clerk or something like that, mm. when the actual legal professional, like they settled it, but all the legwork was done by somebody else. Um, purely administrative tasks, so like preparing a cover email to accompany a letter. They sort of were a bit funny with that. Um, any work that was done to correct a practitioner's own error, 
I think that come up in a bit of dispute that, yeah, if they made a mistake, they were then well, like double charging well, a client. Yeah. So if if there's an argument over the costs, they they can prepare, you can, a client can actually require a bill of cost to be prepared. And a litigation that sometimes happens, bills of costs are prepared and the law firms generally don't do that. They send it out to a cost assessor who puts that document together. They The solicitor gives the cost assessor all of the file. They go through it and they write down, you know, everything. They'll say telephone call from X to Y and such and such a date. Then they'll look up the scale item for telephone call, $35. That'll be written down. And then they'll go, and you know, some of these things can go for hundreds of pages um, in terms of all the little things that have been done. And um, then... The other side has sent a copy of that. They can object to it and say, well, you know, you had three telephone calls to the same client on the same day. Couldn't you have done that in one rather than three times? So these three items should have been one. So we want to knock off two of those items. And then it can actually go to a registrar who's a, a taxing officer who will go through and adjudicate on that. So that can go on for weeks. So <laughs> it's a big case. Um, so, you know, this whole process is around claiming those sorts of costs. But I suppose what I'm saying is you do need to keep a very good file of what time you've spent on it and what you did because everything is based on what's in the file. So your cost assessor is going to need to rely on that. So you've got to make sure you take proper file notes all the way through. And, and if you've written a letter, keep a copy of it on the file, all the rest of it. But um, anyway, look, uh, just, just on this point of the cost, I think the 80 hours is excessive. I don't think $35,000 is $200 is really warranted here. $440, that amount may really depend on the nature of the firm. Some would charge that for, for you know, staff at this level. Others wouldn't. So um, that's a little bit more debatable. Uh, overcharging is regarded as serious misconduct, and there's plenty of cases um, around that. Not, some of them are in the answer guide. Um, so, uh, so what's going to happen to Abdullah, do you think? Well, he might get some form of discipline from, uh, he may well do. Um, but in many respects, it's not his fault. It's the principal's fault for not yeah, supervising yeah, yeah. It properly. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure he's going to get a pretty hefty, hefty reprimand at least. He may, um, he may, you know, I don't think he gets struck off as such. But, I was going to say it would be, it, it's kind of harsh just to say 100% it's the principal's fault because like you think, you know, this person in the position, he should sort of go, okay, I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm in waters that I don't know. I'm going to go and be an adult here where my big boy pants go and have a chat to my principal and say, I don't feel or believe you're giving me enough, whatever. What yep. do I need to do? Am I on the right track? So, I mean, right. definitely room for reprimand. It's not just that 100%. It's a principal. Obviously, both of them would be at fault. But, yeah, the, naturally the principal will, will wear majority of the discipline. Yes, that's um, right. But I think it would be, yeah, terrible if old mate here was to get off completely scot -free. He's not going to get off scot-free, but his, his career is not going to end over this. Um, but the other thing on top of that too is they're saying there's another two practitioners at that firm. Yeah, so he had opportunity not just to go to the practitioner, the owner. He could have sought potential advice from two other people there within the firm. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, um, all right. Just just in the remaining few minutes, the principal is, is really in deep trouble here. Um, they've employed a first-year solicitor. They haven't supervised them, haven't provided any guidance, left them to their own devices. So the, the, they're going to be held liable for lack of supervision. Um, that duty hasn't, you know, they haven't... Um, supervised properly and um, they're going to you know I would have thought that's some um, unsatisfactory professional conduct at the least um, for them uh, the actual complaints process um, would be the next sort of item you would go through um, so I won't go through that because we're, we're out of time but I've got to talk uh, can I just ask there. you a question before you sure. sign yeah. on yeah. Um, on page 12 of the study thing, it says um, barristers and solicitors um, have uh, some immunity from litigation for negligence in respect to advocacy. 
what is some yes so there's there's advocates immunity but um generally um it's very hard you got to remember the position of a barrister is arguing on their feet and responding to things as they you know as they arise so if them them there's a greater chance or possibility that they will make an error in that sort of scenario because they okay. don't have the time to look up things when they're responding to questions or they have to object to something. So there is an immunity to protect them. Oh, okay. That also applies in relation to solicitors who are acting as advocates. Okay, um, so, so it's a bit like you know, the politicians in Parliament, they sort of got a protection. They have a protection. It's just it's just because the nature, you know, humans make errors and they're more likely to do that in that sort of environment. And if there's no protection, then it's a really risky occupation being an advocate. So there's less likely that people would want to be an advocate. So there is a protection there. Um, anyway, yeah. So that's what that's re that's what that's referring to. Um, all right, so um, anyway, we might stop out. I've set out all the actual complaints process. You know, it's, it's getting late now. We can't go through all of that now, but it's there. Um, now, I think next week we've got a break, haven't we, from memory? We've got, we've got our Easter break now, and then you've got a, this multi-choice exam coming up soon. Now, I did. Uh, there was a question about how the questions are structured, so I did send a response out to that. So it's very clear. You know, it'll say how many choices apply to the particular scenario. So, so you'll know that, and then you've got all the choices listed. Um, so that's how they're structured. There's no negative marking. So if you run out of time, it's always best to guess the remainder. <laughs> do you get your mark at the end straight away, or Sorry, do, you to, do you get your mark at the end when you complete, or do you have to wait for you to assess it? No, it's assessed automatically, um, but they won't. Like you don't get the mark immediately you've completed because there's other people and there's a window of time for people to do the exam. So what will happen is when that window passes, then the results will be available. Yeah. So that's how it works. Um, but uh, you'll be you'll be fine with that. You just you just just go through the materials methodically and you won't have any problem with that with that quiz. Um, it's my experience over the years we've been running these things, so I don't think you'll you'll be any different from any other group that's um, done the same thing. Okay, so you're all okay. You know, good break. You need to have a break. So have a good Easter, and um, I'll see you after the break. Thank you, Steve. I think that might be the, I think that might be the last thing I do. I think that's the. I think I, I end at week six. Then uh, Victoria comes and does the rest of the course. But if you've got any questions at any time about anything in the course. I don't mind answering any of those. Okay. Thanks, Stephen. Okay. Bye.